So I'm going to uh, welcome the first speaker for this morning. So we have four speakers today, and at the end we will have a panel and question and discussion. So I think we will have a half an hour uh, presentation from uh, Jean-Louis, and after that uh, we will have questions if you need. So Jean-Louis uh, Denis is professor of health policy and management at the School of Public Health, University of Montreal, senior scientist on health system and innovation at the Research Center of the SHUM, and holds the Canada Research Center Chair on Governance and Transformation in Healthcare Organization and Systems. Thank you, Jean-Denis. Jean. Yes, I think it's already there. Yes, perfect. So th thank you, thank you for the invitation. I will do it in English with my accent. So, but I guess you will survive. So, um, when I discuss with Cathy the program, <coughs> like uh, she wants to ensure that there are no much overlap between presentations. So she asked me more to focus on the notion of systemness and the conceptual basis of it. So what I will do is I will talk first about persisting challenge in the care system to achieve systemness. Second, I will talk around six principles that may help our system moving toward toward increased degree of systemness, these principles being more based on organizational sociology than organizational economics, because I know here there is a strong basis in economics. And the third part, I will use quotation from paper regarding integration of care, innovation and improvement in various care system. And I use it as a kind of secondary data to address some dimension related to the question of systemness. So, uh, first challenge, as you know, at least in the Canadian healthcare system, but I think also in many healthcare systems, including subsist subsystem in US and system in continental Europe, they face persisting challenge in trying to significantly improve, integrate, coordinate the system. And the topic of integration of care is not new. Like we, we, the first time I heard about integration of care was probably as a main challenge was probably 30 years ago. So we still struggling with a relatively simple concept, but very difficult to execute. So. And as you know, we had many, many phases of strong restructuration, reorganization. I'm not necessarily saying that playing with structure, and we will see later, is unuseful to support integration and systemness, but it's a matter of calibration. And this is, of course, here uh, with some humor around this. And then a, a very uh, credible person, Donald Berwick, and we won't read this quotation, but underline clearly that bringing significant improvement, and I will use improvement and integration, not as synonymous, but they gravitate around some kind of same issue in the system. How you bring change that add value for patient? And, and he underlined clearly here, one thing is that context is important and we need to think seriously where people work, how they work, in which context. It's not just a question of broad policy in the system. Policy are important, but they play a supportive or a limiting, limiting factor in creating this environment where desirable change will be achieved. And uh, for organizational theorists, we like to think about the healthcare system as a place where there are fantastic things, but at the same time, it's much more easy to do the same thing than we used to do, than bringing about significant change for all sort of reasons, including the difficulties in reallocating resources around priority, moving resources 
within the healthcare system is very difficult. And this is a quotation from the ads. I think it was the uh, Health Service Restructuring Commission in Ontario at the end of the 90s and early 2000s. And in a 205 book on their legacy, they underline this problem of system building. They say, after all these restructuration, we still struggle with the question, with the issue of generating enough systemness within the healthcare system, meaning connection among it, their component, coordination, alignment across the different level of governance. And, and uh, it's fun to talk about persisting challenge in the Canadian healthcare system, like recent analysis by Southman from the European Observatory of Healthcare a Fed system conclude almost the same in what he qualified as tax base or public health care system. And he talks about these persisting challenge and he underlines something that is important for the discussion this morning is that the kind of public comment and control structure that run our system it's good to have some, but uh, too much is not very contributive. It may be a topic that we can discuss with someone later this morning if we have some visit. And uh, Stephen Lewis, which is a, a careful observer for, uh, I guess, 40 years of the healthcare system uh, in Canada and abroad, published in the New England in 2015, and the title is very revealing, A System in Need Only, Access vari and Variation. And one of the key issues in creating systemness is this question of unlegitimate variation of practice and how we can have guidelines, standards, policy, training, capacity development that help producing these variations. So then I switch to second part, six guiding principles to support the development of systemness. And I'm very influenced in talking about these principles by the reality of our healthcare system in Canada, understanding that there are variations across province and they are more on the side of process than structure. And in conclusion, I will calibrate the role of structure and restructuring. So six guiding principles. The first one is we have more and more to consider our healthcare organization and understand also our healthcare system as a living organism that is that that is largely driven by emergence. Like when we talk about integrating care, we talk about providing support to things that are clinically and uh, clinically, I mean, that will have value added to patient care experience and trajectory. And we talk also about finding a way to make things occupationally relevant and correct. That means that the it's the clinical that must drive this process. That's what I mean by emergence. And then we can pile up on this formal to policy system coordination and so on. And this somewhat illustrates this and it's nice cartoon, but not useful. The second thing is, <laughs> is a productive resistance as a resources to adapt organizational and managerial decision and system. And to make the story short, you may have the best top policymaker, the best minister of health, the best top executive team. And of course, it's all uh, essential resources to improve a system at large scale. But these great people need to face what I call, what some people call, and I adhere to this, productive resistance from the basis of the system. At some point, we need good connection between these levels, and, and we need space where these people can voice their view. Not We don't have to agree, but can voice their view, can propose strategies to integrate care, and can, in a sense, 
take momentarily control of the agenda. If it's just from the top, not enough productive resistance, we cannot benefit from forces of emergence in the system. Third things, and this comes from the economic of complementarity, there may be major catalysts for change and innovation in that care system, and the regular suspect is technology, health information system, electronic medical record, they are all fundamental piece and they may be major catalysts. But what we learn by studying change in complex organization is you cannot stop there. You need to bring about change in synchrony in the way you deal with human resources and the way you deal with talent and capacity in the way you deal with incentive and so on. And then the P4 for principle, it's very well taught, as you see, is taking work seriously. I think there was a period in, I came more from organizational sociology, and there was a period in organizational sociology where we cannot think about an organization without understanding it carefully how uh, people work, what are their tasks, what are their objectives, which challenge they face. So, and I think when we think about systemness in a quite paradoxical way, we need to go more macro and understand what Russ called my macro system, micro clinic, clinical system, and then taking this learning and moving up to help developing the proper structure. And then P5, countervailing power and alignment of incentive. Uh, if I start with incentive, uh, evidence show that it can have a reinforcing effect, but it's not the core of it. Like it's important, but it plays a reinforcing effect to help people staying in tune with some alignment. And if we don't want to do the same thing for the next 20 years, we need what we call in sociology countervailing power, bring other people around the table. And this explains partly the popularity of patient partnership engagement. And maybe we have not also play enough with the notion of citizen participation, involvement in policy design. And this is less a principle, but maybe a kind of, of summary of these more guiding principles for systemness is we need to pay attention to practice what people do to process the dynamic of the system in work context, not just at the policy level. And systemness would be an achievement, which means it's a forge for it will be it will be never achieved for eternity. It's a constant challenge where system needs to constantly adapt. And technology and scientific discovery by itself will always push this push the system at the margin of being non-adaptive. Systemness now, and I should have put systemness, integration, improvement, and innovation, and then system. This is the third part where I use this kind of narrative from different paper to make an argument. So I will skip this because Roxanne covered this well. And uh, like, if you look at one of the paper, Beaven, and I think it's Janus, uh, they look at the US experience and the, and of course, when we see US experience, they, they look at some uh, uh, good candidate like Kaiser and so on. And, and, and they develop a very simple argument saying something that we know that you cannot, by government, dicta say achieve systemness. This will not work. You can push them in some direction, but systemness will be achieved by our level of the system. So that's mean that people need to get involved and they need to find the resources in their own context and they they 
describe it in their own way, organization of design and formation system. And one thing that is very important is longevity. And you know, we are all attached to longevity, but it's same thing for organization and then system. You don't decide Monday to achieve integration and systemness and Monday evening it's done. It takes times and maturation to this system because of principle three of the multiple component of change and synchrony. And learning is very important in this process. Uh, another example in Canada, and I just use this example as illustration, Canadian Foundation of Health Improvement, they got interested in this idea of six levers for health system transformation. And the idea is more and more in discourse from various parts of the system and in various systems, there is this recognition that you don't achieve real reform by just using structure or by just using capacity development like training. You need to play without the component. You get the same in the study of Buchanan and Fitzgerald in the NHS England. Another aspect is capacity development. This is just a model that we formalize based on the collaborative quality improvement in the Atlantic province. But we have the bad habit in healthcare of asking people do things very significantly different, but you don't need to learn nothing and you don't need to have time to do this. And in other industry, when we think about people doing things differently, we invest in capacity development and we give minimum time to get adjust and do things differently. And then uh, with Ross, we did a kind of uh, very, very, a quite quick analysis of comparing uh, uh, and so-called high-performing healthcare system. And what you get here, and we won't detail this, is the importance of an alignment between the structural context, and I put in this incentive and formation system and so on, and the practice that people develop, and both nourish, nurture one each other to create more performing organization. And then if you look at this study by Greenall and colleague in London, Great Area on the transformation of its system. There is a growing attention to mechanism that people activate to relate their context of practice and some outcome. And these mechanisms rely on the various levers for change that we just discussed. And then there is the question of innovation. And, uh, and if I remember well, uh, Monique Beja was Minister of Health uh, at the federal level, used to say even at the, at the United Nations that Canada is a great place, but it's a landscape. I'm not pretending it's her exact word, but it's a landscape of pilot project. And the subtitle was great idea, great pocket of excellence, but a lot of difficulties in use the term you want, spreading, scaling up. And, and systemness will be only achieved by paying more attention on credible local experience that become supported by plausible evidence. And then now we can move this at a larger scale. As long as we don't invest in this process, we won't be able to achieve systemness because good things will stay relatively localized or confined. And there, is, there are a pile of work now to try to understand the process by which you, you move from local experiment to system achievement. And the Scotland Healthcare System published recently, well, this is not to read and I'm not in ophthalmology, it's not a test for you, but they, they published recently a report about how to make innovation navigating more rapidly and across the Scotland and care system. And uh, another important piece in that conversation is the work of 
the International Foundation of Integrated Care. And I just do, look at some recent paper that try to summarize their learning on how you integrate care. And this is all, you, you probably know this, but you go on the website, it's all free, all open access and so on. And, uh, and one of the conclusion of the chair of this foundation after having looked at many, many experience across different healthcare systems is that we must become better at smoothing over the many obstacles and challenge to implementation. So th this is the question of execution and I will come back to this in the end. We are relatively good in healthcare in having, and we saw this in Roxanne last slide, like here the, the full picture of integration, here the different type of integration, here how much you may need across governance level, here the vertical, here the horizontal, and then the challenge is how you take this and you fabricate a system with it. And, and I guess when we talk around systemness, there are two, two pole intention for some people, it's better approach to manage complex medical care problem, which is from disease management, for advanced chronic management disease, for all these things that make more manageable, complex, and during tissue. And then you have another aspect, which we often for, forgot in our, our discussion, which a uh, health system, which is not just a healthcare system, will probably strive also to have an impact on the health of the population. This makes sense economically, this makes sense in terms of equity too and so on. And these things I, are probably partly intention, how far you can go when you work within the, the boundaries of so-called system, how far you can go in generating value for population health. And this is still uh, an open debate in my view. Then if we go more at the policy level, and this is again an example from Scotland, and they really insist on having more, what I, how can I say this, of having a strong policy leadership like to achieve this and it's not the topic of today but we work more and more on at this interface between policy capacity and the delivery side of the system and now you connect both and this is something that we can discuss later in the morning if we have some visit and persisting dilemma is what we do with the structural levers when we want to bring about change and I think it's still an open, an open question. Like we may have used too much structure in our system, massive restructuration, and not just in Quebec, Ontario, as it's those in the 90s, other province, Alberta, a major restructuration. Too. We're not unique in this. And a recent studies in I guess it's in the Plymouth area, Southeast London, uh, a quite good report by a very credible uh, researcher on integration of care. And they conclude that in the context, at least in this area, in the context of the NHS England, with, with people, in, with physicians in various clinics, and various organizations and public health care organizations. And they look at the case of, of Sweden with public owned polyclinics. They conclude that structural integration may have value added. You can try to play it virtually, but it may have value added in some context. But they also underline that this requires renovating the governance of the system in line with having more professional <coughs> partnership, various form of arrangement, clinic cooperation between public and care organization and the so-called private sector that are more or less 
uh, at least for 70 percent paid by uh, the public purse so they they don't throw in the garbage the structural levers but they say we need to be more creative with it and it's not harsh restructuration only and then uh, if you take this paper in health affair on cases that our u.s colleague know well veteran health hospital and and i'm not saying it's good or bad veteran health i'm just saying that they describe systemness as the more formalized aspect of structure so maybe we need both we need a, the right calibration of the structural lever without the other stuff i put in the principle so moving forward i guess how many time left i'm okay, I'm okay with time so moving forward activating the six guiding principle for system this and that care and i would do a small detour not because it's fashionable but we had a seminar russ and me in february with marie bien on on complex adaptive system and again this is not new idea what is interesting here is they start uh, starting from another from another viewpoint and looking a lot at private organization not just public not just at care they are they are most arrive at the same conclusion than some of the principle that that you need to nurture self-organization learning and reasoning on action reasoning on practice there are all sort of academic uh, come uh, not very useful term around this but this idea is how you make professional in team and i include also manager mm -hmm. in context reflecting on their practice to help achieving integration improvement innovation and so on with a reasonable dose of evidence in this and she also insists on this aspect of interaction and interaction is are very important like people adapt work through interaction if i stay alone at home and switch off my email and i work there one month it's become very difficult to adjust the way i will work on a given research project or paper i need interaction with some people and she insists on what she called the powerful emergent. And this is again a, a cute slide, but this idea here is that she look at organization, and this is somewhat a caricature with two sphere, the operational system, which is work, but also the system of const constraint, contingency, and the entrepreneurial system, which is really the innovation drive. It's not necessarily at the <laughs> strategic apex of the organization. And her argument is that there is a sphere in between that she calls adaptive space. And when people connect in this sphere, clinical, manager, patient, people from the community, you can put all sorts of player that you think will have value added you increase the art of generating innovation that you will be in a position to implement. So what I try to do in this uh, short talk is looking at some guiding principle that may have moving from a integration as we used to talk to a notion of systemness based on taking seriously this idea that a so-called system is a living organism that where we need to take seriously the emergence and the emergent forces are not only external in the environment are not only economics are not only technological but they they are also endogenous to this organization and this is the dynamic of work when we pay attention to this that help uh, understanding this and these ideas are not just from 
let's call it organization in sociology. Carolyn Toe, one of our famous political scientists in Canada that had 45 years of career looking at health policy in Canada and, the, and comparing why, why Netherlands has more plasticity for change than Canada, than XY, why she compares system. And she concluded that we need to take seriously this question of realism and ask some people in the system, we use context resources to think about working differently. And she used, and she still do very macro study in policy, but, and, and I had conversation with her recently and she said, of course that part is important. That's my politic of redesign. So conclusion, coming back to the sixth principle, what I call a pragmatic approach to support systemness and I get, and by pragmatic, I mean looking at action and collection of free people in real context. First, first, uh, first uh, point in conclusion, focus on problem solving relate to care delivery and patient experience. We have all sorts of reform. We need to focus on this for the next stage. And this connect with principle one on emergence and principle four on taking work seriously. Recognition and nurturing of distributed capacity, and I can see leadership in professional setting. So we need to look at the system and say, we need specific capacity at the policy level, at the managerial level or meso level, at the clinical level, and within the co community if it's appropriate. And this is the, P2 principle on productive resistance. We need to find a way that people voice more something that has, that is what I call clinically relevant and occupationally correct. A focus on the creation of enabling context for improvement and change, including incentive and countervailing power and countervailing power and changing the conversation, but they generally like patients don't hold out the levers to transform the system. It's more the people that control resources, policy in the system, but they may have an impact. An incentive is adjusting incentive to what we will do with point one and two. Can we help people finding a good reason to consistently improve use evidence and so on. A focus on synergy across multiple change and innovation. This is principle three. A lot of promise in improving data, massive data. And as you know, in Montreal now, it's cutting edge. We have Vivado, these great things on massive data and artificial intelligence and I can influence the way we think about that care, but this need a proper policy, organizational and clinical environment as a vehicle to benefit from this type of scientific uh, policy. And then a reform, I guess this is like a conclusion, a reform from within with top-down guidance. And this is really principle six, where we calibrate restructuring with enough effort and attention paid to how we produce things that can have value for patients. Thank you. Thank you, Jean-Louis. Maybe we have time for one or two questions because it's the beginning, systemness, you talk about principles, so maybe, I don't know, it'll be at the beginning, the morning, you have questions? need to give you that because we register the conference so it's important. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Sam Benaroya. Um, we've been talking or you've been talking about the philosophy of moving this forward and of course many of us here work practically in the current health uh, care reform which has been uh, a turbulent revolutionary and very interesting to date. Um, I would like to know if the current reform is in uh, 
complementarity with your principles or if there are certain aspects of it that contradict the principles that you've put forward. In particular, your major principle that much of the reform to achieve systemness needs to come from within with local uh, innovation, leadership, etc. Are we too much in the uh, structuration and top-down approach uh, model, which can lead to challenges going forward, or is the reform going in the right direction? Thank you for the question, and uh, I was somewhat expected this. Like I guess, and it's and it's fun. I guess the way I will see it, and you may have seen some comment publicly in the newspaper that I made on the healthcare system, is that by principle creating using structural integration to create larger subsystem. We have example in the world where it works very, very well. And many exemplars are more integrated that way. And even in you and colleague from US know this better than me, but like competition drive a lot of integration even there. But I I think that's why we need to pay attention to the other aspect. And it's never too late to say, okay, we create 26 big box. Let's, let's look like big box. And then we will populate them with the other aspect. This will be the next stage of reform. And of course, this requires adjustment in mindset not just from manager, clinician, but also at the policy and political level. But there, it's good time to do this. And it's possible. Some system do it. But it needs the, the commitment to do it. Thank you, Shmuel. Yeah. OK, so thank you. Oh, yeah, there is another one. Sorry. Just, just a simple question. You mentioned that there are other models or examples of successful integration. Are there any national healthcare system integrations that have taken place which went really well? Britain, Sweden, which didn't have to change after a few years or there weren't problems? Because it's different. I think the private US is very different than national healthcare systems. I guess we have example where things like if you take it and i don't know this as much as i should but some example in nordic country where you have more stability through time the the idea is that there may be not a magic recipes and not a unique one but certainly taking one way if, if it's minimally reasonable and then like Nordic country and Vesela in the local government municipality as a government structure. And then you keep focus enough time to gain the benefits from this evolution. And that I think it's where national ed system can provide a lot of value added having key policy and then letting them mature enough to let the kind of adjustment and development that we discussed. NHS England was probably on a quite good track and then major restructuring. And that that's the problem of political cycle in the system. And, and uh, Deborah Stone, a political scientist said, very often we have reasonable policy in system. The problem is that often politics tr trump policy without playing with words today. And, uh, and, and I think that's where it become more fragile, but 